Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another live edition of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, Harry Simiou. We've got lots and lots to get into. We're going to talk Thomas Partey. There's an update on his fitness. We'll discuss Jurian Timber's uh, inclusion in Arsenal's UEFA Champions League squad. We're going to talk Takahiro Tomiyasu, who's back from the Asian Cup. We'll chat Jorginho White, PSR, and take some of your questions from the live chat. And of course, because I've hit the live button, my neighbour's dogs come out to start barking. Those of you that watch this or listen to this regularly will know what that's all about. A bit of a pain in the ass, but hey, it is uh, what it is. Uh, it's the Chronicles of Aguna. You are with us live. Delighted to say I've got a very, very special guest with me uh, today. Uh, Connor Fahati joins me. Connor, welcome uh, to the show. First of all, did I say your surname right? Because I, I should have asked you, you before we started. Spot on. Spot on, Harry. Absolutely spot on. And fair play to you, mate, because a lot of people can't say it correctly at all. What, what are some of the, the, the examples of, of butchery that you've had? Uh, uh, Fahati, um, Fahati. Um, and yeah, they just they just can't seem to get their head around it, unfortunately. But you were spot on there, mate. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Because I, I always think it's so lazy not to try and get someone's name right. And, I, and when we hit the live button, I was like, shit, didn't ask him. Going to screw it up. Great. But yeah, anyway, here we are. <laughs> um, lots and lots to get into. Um, Connor um, is a, a massive Arsenal fan. Uh, he's a producer at TalkSport. Um, very, very good at what he does. Um, and he's doing some brilliant stuff over on TikTok. If you go into the description below, there is a link to his TikTok account. So go in there and make sure you give him a follow. Um, Connor, I mean, before we get into the specific subjects, this bloody dog is getting louder and louder by the day. Um, <laughs> I, I want to know how you're feeling after Sunday's result. Because it's Wednesday now, right? We've been accused of over-celebrating. We've been accused of over-hyping Arsenal's chances of winning the league now. You know, Martin Odegaard taking photos apparently isn't allowed. Um, you know... I said it on yesterday's show. I find it weird that rather than focusing on the manager running around like Arteta did, people have taken issue with Odegaard um, and his photography skills. But how are you feeling about it all now, the whole situation around Arsenal? Because a few weeks ago, it was, you know, we're not quite as good as we were last season. We're, we're going to fall off the pace and, and it's all going to be a bit of a struggle and a bit underwhelming come May. But now it feels like we're right back in it. Well, this is this is the thing. And the, and the question is, you know, a lot of people, like you mentioned there, saying we're not as good as we were last season. I don't really know if I if I agree with that. I think we just play different. We, you know, we're playing a lot more kind of controlled, you know, some might say slower football, but it's, it's less chaotic. So I don't know if I potentially subscribe to the fact that we're not playing as well as last season. Um, but back to your original point of how am I feeling about it? It was a must win game. And that's why I don't really understand why we're getting accused of over celebrating and all this, because if we'd lost to Liverpool, that's eight points. And people will say, oh, well, you know, you were 11, 12 points ahead last season and, and you know, you threw it away, whatever. But eight points is a lot against a Liverpool team that were in fantastic form. Um, so I, I'm feeling a lot, lot happier about it. And, you know, we've beaten Man City this season, beaten Liverpool this season. I mean, I know we had that that kind of drop where we lost to West Ham and, and we lost to Fulham, but we're, we're right back in it. And I know Man City won again on, on Monday night and we're looking, you know, phenomenal. Um, but we're right in it. And I don't subscribe to this over-celebrating. I think it was a massive game for us. We ended up getting the three points and we're back in the title race. A lot of Arsenal fans were thinking, mm, if we lose this, we're probably out of it. But we didn't. We won it and we're back into it. So... I'm, fe I'm feeling pretty good about it. It's going to be a tall order, of course. Man City look like they're going to get back to their imperious best. Obviously, we are still two points behind Liverpool as well. But we're in, a, we're in a great position and we're in there. And that's all we can hope for. That's it, mate. It's um, it's about enjoying the ride as well. Because I've said this to a few people. Although last season ended in heartbreak and disappointment and frustration and all the rest of it, I really, really enjoyed the ride up until it went sour. Before that, it was great and it was one of the most enjoyable. See, even now, even though it all went the way it did in the end, when I look back on last season, it's probably the most I've enjoyed a season for, you know, five, six, seven, maybe more years. So 
you got to remember to enjoy the ride as well. And I, I don't know about you, but me on a personal level, when COVID happened and we weren't able to go to games anymore and all of a sudden football was seen in this light of maybe not being quite as important as maybe we'd held it in our own minds because other things were going on. I really started to understand the value of being able to go down to a ground, watch a game, enjoy the game, speak about it before the game with your mates, speak about it after the game, the whole, you know, experience. It had been taken away from us for a period of time. And as I say, I know there were more important things going on, but it's taught me to value the good times when when it comes to sport and football and, and Arsenal especially. And so I'm not going to let people tell me, no, you can't enjoy it. You can't celebrate it, blah, blah, blah. And um, I tuned into uh, TalkSport Drive the other day. I think it was Darren Bent and Gabby Agbonlahor. And I was fully expecting Gabby Agbonlahor to be like, Arsenal are ridiculous. And even he was saying like, no, there's nothing wrong with them enjoying it, celebrating it. And yeah, it was refreshing to hear that the majority of people don't have a problem. It's just one or two outliers, isn't it, um, that, that want to make a, a big deal about it. Um, before we dive into some of the subjects that we had lined up, I do want to talk Thomas Partey because there has been an update with regards to his fitness. According to Charles Watts, Thomas Partey is going to miss out on the squad uh, that travels to the London Stadium this weekend where we take on West Ham United. Difficult game that, remember, it's one that we dropped points in uh, in the crucial point last season, despite being 2-0 up. Uh, it came after that Anfield game, didn't it? So it was kind of the beginning of the end that. So it's imperative that we go there and get a good result. And although, as I say, this game is going to come around too soon for Thomas Partey, there is no major concern. Uh, about how long he's going to be out for. Mikel did say in his presser the other day that it could be days, it could be weeks. It feels like it's more like days and that he will be back in training sooner rather than later. That's according to Charles Watts. And obviously, um, Connor, that's really, really positive news. I mean, for me, it was when I heard that he was nearly back, I'm like, great, he makes the world of difference. I think I put out a video titled, I've been waiting all season for this. Um, and then obviously we heard that he had the setback and you're like, oh, for God's sake, again, and, and kind of the frustration takes over. And I was sitting there saying, you know, whether he comes back or not, uh, however well he plays between now and the end of the season, come the summer, we we probably need to move on from him. Where are you on the whole Thomas Partey spectrum, if you want to call it that? Well, we've been starved of seeing that midfield of Partey, Rice and Odegaard, haven't we? It's what every Arsenal fan really wants to see. All we saw Partey was at the start of the season in that kind of hybrid right-back role, which everyone was kind of scratching their heads at. Look, I, I think he's a phenomenal player. I, I think last season, people overlooked the great work that he did due to his drop in form when it really mattered for us. But last season, he was absolutely excellent. My issue, as you've just mentioned there, Harry, is just it's the constant injuries, isn't it? You know, it's not one, it's not two, it's, you know, it's three or four. And then he's out for a prolonged period of time. Then he said he's coming back and then he's gone again. And you're thinking he's not getting any younger. Is it potentially time to cash in at the end of the season and, and maybe get rid of him. But I, I don't know, because when you do see him at his best, he is so good. And then you just think with the addition of Declan Rice into that midfield, you know, Odegaard as well, you just think that could be the perfect kind of midfield three. But it's something that Arteta is going to have to weigh up because it's, you know, he'll he'll be on a decent wage and he's spending a lot of his time on the treatment table. And I don't know if we can afford to carry people at this stage of the season. Um, I know you mentioned Jorginho there earlier. We'll probably get in into him as well. But he, he's he been brilliant as well when he's had to come in. Um, but for me, I'd rather that we keep him because I think he is a great player for us. And I really want to see that midfield three, as I mentioned there. Here's the thing as well, right? Thomas Partey, at his age, isn't going to have that many... I'm not going to say he's not going to have that many suitors. That's the wrong way of putting it. He's a fantastic player. There will be plenty of clubs out there willing to take a bit of a gamble, a bit of a punt on his fitness, and particularly in the leagues where the intensity is less. For example, I think if Thomas Partey goes to Serie A, he's absolutely fine. Um, you know, you, you, you compare his injury record since coming to the Premier League to that that he had in La Liga, and you can see that the intensity is, is probably an issue for him. But how many clubs are going to come in and pay decent money for him? And that's what makes me think that even though, you know, a, a few days ago, as recently as that, I was saying, no, you just got to let him go, move on from him. There is a part of me that thinks maybe if you keep him and manage his minutes and have him as a squad player, be a bit more prepared for the 
very likely possibility that he's not available for long periods of time, then actually he's okay to, to hold on to. If he comes back into the team this season, he walks straight into the 11, doesn't he? That's that's how good he is. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said there last season, you, you, you've you got to remember how well, he, how well he was playing for us and how vital he was for us. Um, until that kind of little little dip in form. But that was only last season, you know, best part of a year, maybe just over a year ago. So he's shown that he still can do it. And as you said, he walks back into that midfield. And I think he he ticks over that midfield as well. And he, and he allows Odegaard to be go further forward. And he can also allow Declan Rice to go further forward because there's been times, and it was nice to see against Liverpool when he was picking up the ball and just driving it. And there's more times that I want to see Declan Rice keep doing that. And I think Thomas Partey will allow, will allow him to do that. But it's as you said, what, what does Arteta kind of want to do does he think right okay as you said as you mentioned there manage his minutes play him when play him as and when he can or does he think you know what might be worth getting him off the wage bill um we'll, we'll get into it profit and sustainability as well kind of leveling that out a little bit more as we know that we do need to get rid of some of some of our players as well for the money that we spent over in the summer um so that's a decision for the manager but i still want to see him come back walk into that midfield have a few games and then maybe see where we are with him yeah, indeed. One for the summer, isn't it? There's no need to focus on that now. Let's let's focus on getting the best out of this Arsenal team and we'll worry about who goes where in the summer. Uh, we'll talk Jorginho in a moment, but I do want to dive into the live comments because there's plenty uh, of you getting involved. A big hello to everybody joining us live right now, to everybody that will be watching this later or listening to it on whichever audio platform it is you get your pods from. Uh, remember, like, subscribe, leave comments, all of that stuff, the engagement piece is really, really important. So please do uh, support the show that way. Um, John Daly says, from when Partey got injured, he's managed to make a baby, have a baby, and he's still not even close to coming back. I don't know how accurate that timeline is. <laughs> I don't um, know either. <laughs> but congratulations to... To, to Thomas Partey, of course, on that. Uh, Leonard says, uh, thank you for that point. Absolutely spot on uh, on Thomas Partey. Because of the slight drop towards the end, a lot of people discarded how important he was for us last season. Only issue is injuries. And I've said this before as well, and I don't know if you agree with this. He had injury problems from the day he arrived at Arsenal. That's fair to say. But last season, mm -hmm. he played 33 out of our 38 Premier League games. So do you think that that led to maybe Arsenal falling into the trap of thinking that actually Thomas is over the worst of this? I, I think so. Yeah, he had a, he had a full season nearly, didn't he? And and was looking really good. I agree. I, I think that that could have potentially happened. I mean, I mean, injuries are part and parcel of, of the game, aren't they? It's difficult to kind of understand how many injuries people are going to pick up and for how long, you know, sustained period of time they're going to be out for. I think the issue with party for me this season is how close it seems like he's going to come back and then it's as he says he picks something up or something delays it you know or you think he's going to be in in for the forest game then you think oh, okay it'll be the liverpool game then it's not the liverpool game and i just wonder you know is there going to be an inevitable continuous cycle of it um but for how good he has been and for how he walks back into the 11 when he is fit i think we just got to keep him and take that risk for the time being uh, John says, uh, with Zubi Mendy incoming, I'm pretty sure he knows himself that he's on borrowed time. He's absolutely amazing on the pitch. Unfortunately, he's not on the pitch that much anymore. Uh, Jean René says, for me, I would keep Thomas Partey and Jorginho and let El Nenny move on, bring back La Conga and sign Zubi Mendy. Um, if we want to continue to fight on all fronts, we need all of them, in my opinion. I'll come back to that one. I'm going to favourite that one because there's a couple of interesting bits in that. I just want to dive mm. into uh, Mario says, hi, Harry, uh, love Parte. I think with him, we will boss most teams in the league, including the big one. He means Man City. Just the issue with his fitness um, that is a real wor worry. And to be honest, I think he'll be gone in the summer. Big hello uh, to uh, Crucial as well, who joins us from Ghana. Shout out to you, mate. Um, OK, so I, I want to go back to, to Jean René's comment because he mentions... Mm -hmm. Jorginho, which we're going to come on to in a minute. He mentions El Nenny, who I think we can all agree is going to leave the club come the summer. There was some talk that he might have gone in January. I just don't think we could afford to allow that to happen because of how short we are in terms of bodies, but also because maybe, um, you know, he he didn't get the offer that he wanted at the time. We'll, talk, we'll even do Zubimendi on another show because I, I feel like we've talked about that a lot in recent times and we're not anywhere near doing a deal for him. So let's leave that. Mm. But Sambi Lakonga, 
He's been really bloody good for Luton of late. I, I watched him against Newcastle at the weekend. And although there's still some deficiencies to his game, I would argue, and I still don't think he's the perfect midfield player, the difference between a confident Lokonga that's playing week in, week out, and a Lokonga that's in and out of a side just seems to be huge. I would bring him back and have a look at him in the summer. But how much is he going to play, do you think? If he point. comes back and, and and stays, because I just think he doesn't get into that midfield, does he? So you're looking at Carabao Cup games, you're looking at FA Cup games, you know, say we get in the Champions League again and we, you know, we're through in the group and we've kind of got a dead rubber last fixture, he probably plays that. But then is that it? I, I, I just don't know. I, I agree with you. I agree. He has been playing some really good stuff for Luton. And you mentioned there are some deficiencies to his game. I saw on one of Newcastle's goals, he lost lost his runner and they ended up scoring. But, you know, that can happen. That can happen to anybody. But again, numbers, I, I, I guess with numbers, if Elneny's going, then maybe you do bring him back. But then equally, if he has a good season at Luton, do you bring him back and then potentially sell him on? And then I was going to, that, that, that was my next question. Is he one that you then use to ease your PSR issues and concerns? Because that's what Arsenal need to do a lot better now, right? We, we've not done it very well for a long time. And we've talked about it so many times on this pod. We're spending, spending, spending to get the team to where we want it to be. But we've never really sold all that well. Lokonga is one that you could potentially bring in some money for. I think you probably need to let one of the Hay Lenders go as well, whether that be in Ketia, yeah. maybe even Emil smith throw. I know some people don't want to hear that, but that that is an option as well. Nelson. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, perhaps he is uh, one that we're going to cash in on almost kind of Joe Willock style. We let Joe Willock go out on loan. He did really well. And we got a fee that we wouldn't have dreamed of getting a year prior off of Newcastle yeah. United. So does it work the same with Lukonga? Fingers crossed. Um, right. Short pause. When we come back, we're going to talk Jorginho in detail. I've been waxing lyrical about him over the last few days, but would I go as far? Would Connor go as far as uh, saying that Arsenal should trigger his one year contract extension option? We'll do that right after this. OK, Jorginho, Connor, where are you at? If you were Arsenal Football Club, would you jump the gun and offer him that contract extension, take up that option um, now? Or would you want to hold fire just a little bit longer? I think I would extend it. I think because it's just one year, he seems to be absolutely loving his football at Arsenal. He seems to be content with the position that he is. He knows he's going to be benched for some games. He knows he's going to come in for some games. And he still shows he can do it. I mean, against against Liverpool, I thought, oh, that's interesting, bringing in Jorginho. I could understand why we did it. I thought, you know, it made a lot of sense. And he ended up getting man the match. And I thought, rightly so, he was deserving man the match. I thought his touch was excellent. I thought his passing was excellent. And he's a leader on the pitch, isn't he? He's a leader. And, you know, Harry, we've been watching Arsenal for years, been supporting Arsenal for years. There's been times where we've been lacking leaders on that pitch you know, season after season. And and he is one of them. I, I think for one for one more year, I think let's do it. I, I can't I can't see it being too much of an issue for us. I think if it was like a, a kind of a thing where you had to do two or three years, I'd probably say, mm, I'm not too sure about that. You know, I think he's 32 now. So, you know, he is getting on a little bit. But for one more year, I think especially if people are coming out the door, depending how much money we got to spend, he's an extra body and a body that seems quite content with um, the position that he's playing at the moment. Yeah, I'm I'm of the same opinion. When I think about what makes Jorginho a, a good squad player and a useful player, I think of experience, I think of technical ability, I think of leadership, I think of know-how, and I think of his intelligence, which none of which, by the way, is going to diminish with age, really. Um, you know, we've talked about him maybe not being physically up to it in the past, and I still think that's relevant. But given that he never really had that stuff, is, it, is there going to be much difference between Jorginho in February 2024 to Jorginho in December 2024 and maybe slightly beyond that? Probably not. And that's why I think if I were the club, I'd want to be proactive in that. Because especially if you think that Thomas Partey could be off in the summer, letting Jorginho go at the same time makes the summer lifting much heavier. And again, we know that PSR is a problem. And so maybe this is the way to go. Also, doing it now and at least opening that line of conversation with the player and his representatives 
will, I think, give him a kind of warm feeling. It will say, you know, Georgie, we really value you. We love what you bring. And it stops him, you know, looking elsewhere. It stops him maybe trying to force a move elsewhere. And I still think that even after this year, if he does another year, I still think that Jorginho could then go and play in Italy or go and play in Spain if that's how he wants to end his career or, or back in Brazil or whatever. So it's, um, mm. it's a bit of a no-brainer for me. And I don't say this based solely on what we saw against Liverpool. I've been a big advocate of Jorginho since we signed him and I've had a lot of stick. Mm. Um, if you go back to the pod we did before the Liverpool game where I said I'd play Jorginho and I'd probably play Havertz up front, the stick I got for that but look how they perform because they do have uses just in the right environments. Totally, totally. And, you know, he went onto that pitch against Liverpool, all the stars on the on that pitch, all the players that were focused on pre-match, and he ended up getting man the match, you know, rightly rightly so as well. And leader, leader on and off the pitch, he's got the quality, he's got the experience. And I think, as you mentioned there, with maybe party going, El Nenny will definitely go. And how much money we've got to spend? I think you just you trigger that contract extension. You keep him there for an, for another season, and he's a body. You know, he's a body that can come in in different games and help out. And as you mentioned, you know, it doesn't take too much off him. He can go then go potentially go back to Italy the following year or go wherever else he wants to go. Um, but yeah, for me, I agree with you. I think it's a no brainer. I think we should keep him on. Yep, definitely, definitely. Um, just looking at what everybody's saying in the chat. Um... John Daly says uh, he's more than a player. He's a leader on that touchline as well. He's a sensible guy that knows his role now. And off the field, he is a model professional. Uh, Hale Gunner says, no wonder Jorginho is actually producing some output. His contract renewal time is always one. There's always one. Uh, Yassin <laughs> says, uh, Jorginho is an excellent squad player. I've underestimated him massively and was impressed against Liverpool. However, he needs to be a squad player and nothing more. He's a very much, Connor, a horses for courses guy. There are certain yeah. games where he, he fits, right? There are certain games. For example, if you're at home against Burnley and you're facing, like Burnley's a bad example, Sheffield United and you're facing a low block, I don't think you need two of that type of midfielder. I think you could play Rice alone and then put Havertz in there or whatever. Um, but there are games where his stability, I think, is is required. Um, Creambone says... Uh, no brainer. Sign him up for the extra year. He knows what Arteta wants on the pitch and his experience, of course, uh, as well. So um, we're both in agreement on that. Jorginho deserves um, at least one more year. But beyond that, then obviously you kind of need yeah. to reassess it. OK, let's talk Jurian Timber. Jurian Timber was included in Arsenal's UEFA Champions League squad for the knockout stages. doesn't mean he's going to be back tomorrow, but it means that he's on his way back, which we've kind of suspected for a while. But as I said um, on yesterday's pod when I was talking to Tariq, that just reading that, it kind of makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. How much of an impact can he have, Connor, on what remains for of the season? Oh, absolutely. It gives you gives you a great feeling, doesn't it? He wouldn't be included in that Champions League squad if, if they didn't think he was going to play some sort of part, um, depending how far we go. I think he could be seriously influential and instrumental for us. Um, we only got to see him for, what, the Community Shield and then Nottingham Forest playing in a kind of left-back role, which was uh, surprised a few people, not what we originally signed for. But Left back has kind of been a position that we've, we've chopped and we've changed, haven't we, between kind of Sinchenko, Tomiyasu... Um, and Kivior's played there as well at, at times. Uh, I think I think I think it's great. I I think we need a player like that because you always do feel an injury to Saliba, an injury to Gabriel, um, you know Ben White as well, and we're looking a little bit short there. So to get him back, get him back, sorry, would be brilliant because that Community Shield game, I thought he was he was brilliant, and against Nottingham Forest, he started really well until he got that unfortunate injury. Um, and there was a lot of excitement around him. It looked like a really good signing. We scouted him well. He looked like he was going to fit in really, really well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, hopefully we, we get to see him back relatively soon. I mean, I don't know how soon. I think they said March originally, didn't they? So hopefully around that March time. Um, but he could have he could have a brilliant impact. And it's just having another player, isn't it? It's another player that can bring a sort of a different dynamic to the team. And it's nice to know sometimes that if a game's not going your way, you can change certain things. And and he's one of those players you could either start with or kind of bring on to to sort of change it around. So, yeah, 
fingers crossed it's soon. Yeah. And, you know, going into the season, I was looking at that back line and I said, with him coming in, with his versatility, with Tommy Asu's versatility, with Kivior moving into a new season, you know, that w- actually for me, the back line was complete. You know, two very good goalkeepers. Right back options would be Tommy Asu, Timba, and White, three. Left back, it would be Zinchenko, Timba, Tommy Asu, mm-hmm. Kivior, four. And then at centre back, you've got. Gabriel, Saliba, White can play there. Tommy Asu can play there. Timber can play there. Kivio can play there. And all of a sudden, that back line looks really kind of solid. One of the issues I think we found this season, and I, I mentioned this on a, a podcast going into the January transfer window. A lot of people didn't quite grasp what I was trying to say. And obviously, the, the Twitter mob didn't like it. But what I was trying to say was that basically, you can build a team like that under that pretense of having lots of versatile players the problem is though is that when you lose one of those players you're then short across multiple areas so in losing jury and timber we lost right back cover center back cover and left back cover now it's a cost effective way of doing it because you can spend bigger on individual players making sure they're of a higher quality therefore you know you you get the best in class but it's still only one body and if you're short on bodies you can find yourself in a bit of a sticky situation. And that's almost certainly happened to us. I think over the course of this season, up until now, touch wood, we've been quite lucky that Gabriel and Saliba have been as available as they have. Because if they're not available, then all of a sudden you look um, you look a little bit exposed. But I think he's going to be massive coming back. Um, just, I, I think the versatility thing, but I think psychologically for the whole team and, and for him, it's going to be special, isn't it? Because he gets his dream move joins a club, plays in the community shield, brilliant that day, starts the first Premier League game of the season and just after half time, he's gone with an ACL injury. So um, that's that's massive. Tommy Asu's uh, back as well from the Asian Cup. Um, is he one that you'd persist with Connor going for? Because when we talk about patchy injury records, he certainly falls into that category. He certainly does, yeah. But I, I think with the, you know, potential issues that Zinchenko's had this season, you know, it is defending not being not being too good and the fact that Arteta's used Tomiyasu quite a few times in that kind of position. I think he is someone that we we should potentially persist with. He's also versatile as well, don't forget. So, you know, he can play that left back, he can play that right back, and he can also play centre back as well. I think he's only about 24, 25 as well. So he's got he's got youth youth on his side. And and I think it's someone we should we should probably stick. I think we should stick with him because He's got time on his side. He's shown to he's shown in games, you know, that he can that he can do a job, that he can be solid. Um, and unless we're gonna go out there and, you know, buy somebody who can come in and, and is better than him, I think he is a good body to sort of remain with and keep him there. Does he start for me? No. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, potentially get rid of Zinchenko and start Tommy Asu at left back, but I quite like what Zinchenko brings to that team. I know he went off at half time against against um, Liverpool, and fair play, Kivior came on and, and did a job. But I think what Zinchenko brings you going forward um, is excellent. I know his defensive ability, you know, comes into question, and we saw after the Forest game, Ben White was having a little bit of a go at him, which I thought was slightly harsh. Um, but back to Tommy Asso, I think yeah, I think you persist with him, and I think he is the man that you you stick with. You don't start him, but you can bring him in if necessary. Left you alone there. I don't know what happened. The connection just went. That's all right. <laughs> Go ahead, mate. Carry on with whatever you were um, saying. I, I was just saying, um, I think he is somebody that you persist with. I don't think you start him, um, but he is somebody that can come in. He can cover in, in multiple positions. And unless you're going to go out there and buy somebody else um, to come in and take that role, I think I think you stick with him. Yeah, I I agree as well. And I do think his injury record is a bit patchy. But when you're not relying on someone as one of your first 11, I think you can have a bit more um, leniency when it comes to that kind of thing as well. Um, I I don't know that this is true, um, but I sort of, you know, we've been hearing a lot uh, about his uh, his contract situation that he's agreed a new deal with Arsenal. That's yet to be announced, but there's been lots of talk about that over the last 24, 48 hours and he is on a he is currently on a 55k a week salary which isn't really that big 
when you think about what some of the likes of Kai Havertz are on and all the rest of it. So he's going to get a bump up on that, of course. That'll be part of the new deal. But, I mean, unless you're talking double, triple the salary, then it's still a salary that I think you can kind of deal with in the event that he's not always available. Um, So I I don't think that's one that they'll be too concerned about financially. I don't think what I'm trying to say, I don't think they'll be weighing up their injury concerns with the financial concerns as much as they might do when doing some other deals because of the starting point of Tommy Asu. Um, Apologies for the disconnection there mid podcast. Thankfully, Connor was still on the screen. He's he's much better looking than me anyway. So you you got to uh, (laughs) take that. That's all good, man. I don't know what happened. I just said not connected. Bang. Off we go. It's happened before, but not for a, a long, long time. Um, thankfully, our listeners are used to be being absolutely shit with tech, so uh, nobody's, <laughs> uh, nobody's going to complain too much, uh, I don't think. Right, uh, we're going to take a short pause, and when we come back, we're going to discuss a bit of Ben White. I'm interested to get Connor's thoughts on Ben White because I think he's improved uh, a lot in recent weeks. Not that he was ever bad, but it feels like he's back to his best. Okay, talk to me about Ben White. Mr. Consistent is is what I've called him over the last couple of years because I think his performance levels very rarely drop. I do think, though, in the games against Forest and Liverpool, we saw a significant upstep. So we're not just seeing a good Ben White. I think we're seeing a peak Ben White at the moment. What have you made of his recent displays? He stepped it up, hasn't he, Harry? Um, I, th- I think... He's been excellent, Mr. Consistent. I mean, he's made he's made that right back position his own, hasn't he? And um the link up play that he has with Saka on the right is excellent. I mean, he's overlapping again, which at the start of the season he was he wasn't really doing that much. And I wondered whether it was more of a kind of shift change in the way that we were playing, but he wasn't overlapping as much, but he started to do that again. And he's defending as well. I mean, he's he's really improved. There is sometimes times he slightly worries me, and, and I, I don't know what it is. It's it's when they kind of it's when teams do the sort of cross field ball really far out wide, and he stays really narrow, almost like a like a third centre back. And half the time, I'm thinking, no, get out, get out, push out towards him. Because sometimes I'm a little bit worried that they're going to get a free crossing or a free shot. But other than that, he, he's really solid. There's not many times he's been skinned. He doesn't really get megged, and, and there was a lovely bit of skill he did on. Um, it was either Curtis Jones or Jota where he took the ball and just flicked it round him, and then ran around the side and I was like that is a man that is just oozing confidence and I mean I know I don't want to get too much into it but I, the fact that you know he had his troubles with England and, and and left the camp whatever but really he should be in that England squad that's going to the going to the Euros I, I don't, don't think he will be I think the issues that he's had with Southgate and Steve Holland whatever have kind of ruined that but he's been absolutely excellent and made that position his own and he's one of our key players Harry I mean we talk about you know the likes of Saliba and uh, Saka, but I think he's up there. I really do. I think he's up there, one of our key players. And you look at that team and if you don't see him there, you're like, oh no, what's going on? And when you do, you think you're going to get an eight or nine out of 10. And against Liverpool, he was excellent. Yeah, he was indeed. And uh, you're right to highlight his kind of confidence and and the way he's just so casual. It seems like he's so casual sometimes. And I think, you know, what plays to the narrative as well, the, the fact that he's, he doesn't really like football, apparently. Like, I love that that is a thing that just winds people up. It's like, how can you be so bloody good at something that you don't really have a passion for? It just irritates people, doesn't it? It's amazing. Um, <laughs> he doesn't like it at all. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't. And I think you're right when you say that sometimes when there's a quick switch of play, that he does have that tendency to stay a bit narrower. I think that's down to a couple of things. So I think the first thing is that because our left back is often in midfield, it, it does become a back three, which means that, I think he needs to keep that relatively short distance between himself and Saliba. And it's almost like I listened to something that Diego Simeone done many years ago. It was like a coaching seminar thing. Um, and basically what he was saying is that the way to defend always, and, and if there's one man that knows how to set up a defense, it's Diego Simeone, is that you focus on dealing with the width of your penalty area and you almost surrender that space wide of your penalty area if you're short of bodies because what what you're asking the player to do essentially is either pick someone out which you've got an opportunity to defend because it's a cross or you're asking them to score from what could be an impossible angle and at that point you've got to look at your goalkeeper that's what he said and and it was really interesting to see that in a lot of these top coaches minds that the the instinct and the first thing to do the go-to is 
right? Protect the width of the box at all costs. And I think that's where that comes in with Ben White. You also got to factor in that for most of his career, he's been a centre back. And I yeah. think that that kind of natural instinct of kind of getting back in a more central position maybe kicks in a bit. But the adaptation to playing at right back has just been unbelievable. A player who's probably struggled, who's a centre back that's gone into playing fullback quite a bit for us this season is Jakob Kivio. Although I thought against Liverpool, mm -hmm. he did a good job. And that kind of leads me on to a nice question um, that Nilton put in. It's a hypothetical one. We'll never know. But he's asking if we think that had Kivio not come on and Zinchenko stayed on against Liverpool, would we have conceded uh, another goal in that game? I don't know. Uh, Zinchenko it's difficult didn't really to do say, much wrong it? in the first half, did he? The goal wasn't his fault. It was a mix-up between Saliba and Raya and ended up being poor old Gabriel who got the own goal and he wasn't at fault. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. I'm going to back to me. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he he wasn't required to go searching in midfield against Liverpool because of the fact Jorginho was in there along mm. with Rice. And Jorginho was playing the kind of left-sided position. So it, it gave Zinchenko even less reason to go into those areas. And I think that's why he looked more secure. A lot of the time when he gets caught out, it is because he's just not naturally a defender and maybe he's a bit too, yeah, I think, slow to react to things and stuff. It's why Ben White had a go at him, right? After the Forest game, yeah. he didn't step up quickly enough. But at the same time, I think a lot of it is down to the adventurous role that he's asked to play. So in that game where he wasn't really expected to do that because of the structure of the rest of the team, I thought he looked um, a, a lot more comfortable. So I think, Nilton, you're being a bit harsh. But I mean, <laughs> I went into the game saying to my, um, saying to my dad as we, as we were heading down there, thank God. Salah's not about because Zinchenko and Salah is like a, a nightmare waiting to happen, isn't it? Yeah. We've seen it too many times now. Um, I want to get your thoughts, uh, Connor, on PSR. Um, there's a lot of talk about the Premier League clubs getting together to kind of rediscuss this, um, maybe reshape how it currently works. It's been something that's been in place for a long time, actually, but it's only really become a thing of late because we've seen teams punished for not adhering to it. Mm. I was as frustrated as anybody that going into January, we couldn't do a bit of business just to boost our hopes and chances and, and deal with some of the, the shortcomings we have in the squad. But overall, if I take my Arsenal hat off, I think it's a really, really good thing for the Premier League. Where are you at on it? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think it's trying to make the league fairer, isn't it? And I, and I think that's something that we need to do because we've just seen Manchester City go out and buy the best players. And that's why they've ended up winning three of the last four Premier League titles. So I, I can understand it from that point of view, but I think they're trying to do a, a one-fits-all rule and I don't really think that works. And that's kind of why teams like Everton and Nottingham Forest have got caught out by it. And I, and I think if you're going to keep it in, there's some changes that you potentially might need to make. But then also from a work point of view, it was quite nice to have a January transfer window where nothing really happened <laughs> and not having Chelsea going out and paying... 110 million for, for one player. But then you do see teams like Everton, don't you? Nottingham Forest get done for it. And then you're like, well, have Chelsea got away with this because they've spent all of that amount of money? Or City with their 115 charges, whatever it is. And we don't know a date when that's going to happen. So I think something needs to be done to sort of cull the spending. Um, but then equally, it's frustrating when, like you said there, Harry, when you need a couple of extra bodies in January... And you're then not able to do it because you don't want to sort of break the financial rules. But I do think that something needs to be there so that it's not just free for all spending. And, you know, we don't want it's, I guess it kind of is happening with City winning all the leagues, but you don't want to have it where it's just constantly one team winning it all the time or like, you know, constant top four. And that's why it's nice. You know, you've got the likes of Villa who are up, who are up there as well, trying to trying to break that. Um, but back back to your point, I think something needs to be there. I just think maybe they need to sort of have a little look about the way they kind of implement it and maybe not have the one one fits all rule because obviously it's slightly unfair on other teams. Yeah, it's a hard one because obviously the bigger clubs are going to generate more revenue, right? Which means they're going to be um, in a position where you know, they're, they're always going to have that advantage. If you generate more revenue, it means you can spend more. They're always going to be able to spend more. And without allowing owners maybe to come in and pick up other clubs and invest in them and run them really well, it becomes difficult to go. 
to kind of close that gap. Although there are examples like Brighton, for example, whose revenue would be massive because of how well they sell and how cheap they buy for. And that isn't necessarily down to their commerciality as a football club. It's because they run the club really well. So it does leave some leeway for people to be able to close that gap. My issue is is, is that the punishments need to be consistent. So I'm all for this. I, I think this is a good thing. I don't really know that there is a, a one one thing that fits all because just football clubs just operate in different ways. I'm very much not a prem head. I'm not one of those people that like looks at the Premier League and goes, I don't care about everywhere else as long as the Premier League is great because that's what my team plays in. I'm very much interested in how the, the football ecosystem works. And I actually hate the fact that the Premier League has accelerated away from everybody else in terms of finances because I think it damages the quality of European competition. I think it makes markets really awful to deal in. Like, you're a Serie A club, right? Juventus come in for your player. Okay, give us 20 million. Arsenal come in for your player. They're a Premier League club. Give us 80 million. Like, that's what we're, t- we're talking about at the moment. Yeah, the, yeah. the whole system is broken. So I would quite like something like this to, to continue to be in place and to continue mm. to be enforced. But there's got to be some kind of guidelines put in place. Like Everton, they broke the 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 rules by I think it was about twenty odd million quid in the end, eighteen million mm-hmm. something like that. There's got to be a punishment that is put out for that type of breach, and there's got to be a certain punishment that if you breach fifty million or a hundred million or whatever. And while I think in my head that's a good idea, the only thing I can envisage is that if you're a relegation threatened club and you've got the opportunity to go and sign a player, you think is going to make the difference, keep you in the league. You might quite happily spend over what you can if you know you're only going to get a three-point deduction. You might choose to swallow that that punishment in exchange for having that player. So that's my issue with, with it at the moment. It's like I'm calling for consistent punishments, guidelines around what the punishment should be. So you avoid situations like where Everton are going, okay, we broke the rules, but man, 10 points is harsh. But at the same yeah. time, people will just try and work around it, won't they? Exactly. And then the fact that their 10 points was implemented straight away. We still haven't heard anything on Manchester City. Forest have accepted that they breached the rules, but we don't know what's going to happen with them. I agree. I think it's guidelines. And I think people just need to kind of understand because I think people are slightly confused because if I'm right in saying, I think Everton got caught again on the same breach or something from the last one. And, and they're complaining, saying... Is yeah, the, like the problem is, is that it's a rolling three year period, right? So even yeah. when you move into the next year, two of the years that you were initially pulled up for um, still remain in the in the picture. So then your hmm. third year, your most recent year has to be so good that it fixes the previous two. It's just it's yeah. one of those things. Once you're in that mess, I don't really know. Unless you go and sell a player for 100 million quid, how do you get out of it straight away? And it's just going to hmm. keep rolling on. So I think, yeah, I, I agree. I, but. I agree with you as well. I think something needs to be in place. You know, can't just be free free spending like like they have been. Um, but also, I think we just need some guidelines and some understanding as to how they've breached the rules and why they've breached the rules. And then also work out what the punishment is and get consistent to when the punishment is going to be because Everton got those 10 points deducted like that. You know, they were gone. And now we're waiting on the second one. Are they going to come in this season? Is it going to be next season? What's going to happen there? Does that mean that suddenly... Because imagine now, if they get deducted and Forrest get deducted, then that almost brings Burnley back into the equation. Burnley could potentially stay up. So it's like, when are they going to do it and how are they going to do it? I just think we need a little bit more clearance and sort of guidelines on it because it's a bit confusing, I can't lie. Yeah, and it just feels a little bit too convenient. You know, this has been in place for a long, long time. And the minute there's a threat of an independent regulator for the Premier League, they've gone, "Uh uh-oh, we better start dishing out some punishments for this and showing Mm -hmm. essentially that we can, we can police our own shit. And that's basically what, what's going on at the moment. Um, guys, just before we leave, we're going to take a couple of your questions from the live chat. So get them in. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Quick reminder, if you haven't done so already, leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't done so already, if you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review. It really, really does help. Um, go over to Connor's TikTok. Link is in the description. Connor, is there anything else that you want to plug anywhere else you want to be followed? Any Go for it, mate. Over to you. Uh, Sell yourself. You can, you can follow. <laughs> uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well. Connor Fahati, C O N O R F A H E R T Y. Uh, same on Instagram as well. 
you can follow me there, Connor Faherty. And you've mentioned my TikTok as well, Connor Faherty One, which is in the description below. How you how you find in TikTok? Because I'm I'm relatively new to it. Um, I am as well. <laughs> how how are you finding it? I know people might not be interested in this conversation, but we're going to have it anyway. How are you finding it? Because I find it weird. But like, I shouldn't find it weird because I stare down a camera and and do this all the time. But with TikTok, I, I feel like I'm too old for it. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I feel like I'm reading all the time, like, because it's like you're staring down a camera, but it feels like people are like, oh, I feel like there's like a script in front of me. Uh, yeah, it's 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 an odd one, isn't it? Just trying to keep trying to keep up with the times, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Me too, mate. Uh, me too. Um, guys, uh, if you haven't already check out, checked out yesterday's show, uh, check it out because there was some really, really interesting listener questions. I'm going to put one to Connor. Uh, in a minute uh, before we go. Um, but there was also an interview with Ray Parler on that episode as well. That was courtesy of our friends over at NetBet. Um, and it was a mailbag episode largely built around your question. So go back and check that out. It's the last one on the feed, uh, last video on the channel. Um, okay, while we're waiting for a couple more questions to come in through the door, I'm going to ask you this question that was put to us yesterday. And it was really, really good. I didn't want to pre-warn you because I want you to, to okay. do this on the spot. Like if it. you could bring back one Arsene Wenger era player and put them into this current Arsenal team, but you can't pick Thierry Henry, he's the exception, he's not in the equation, who would you bring in? So you can go anyone during Wenger's era except for Thierry Henry. Who fits best in this team? Who addresses the problems that we have? Who's the one you'd go for? I know I've put you right on the spot. That's a great question. <laughs> oh it's a good one isn't it <laughs> that is a really good one um i'll tell you who i went for issues. yeah I, I went for robin van persie i know he's very unpopular among yeah Arsenal fans striker moment, but i think a striker is the That's one who i was thinking there, there was a suggestion yeah. put forward out of by or but yeah just couldn't yeah do it. i couldn't do it alexis sanchez maybe Patrick Vieira, yeah. Ian Wright was spoken about, Pete Nicholas and right, Nicholas. yeah. So many suggestions, but uh, you got to <sighs> nail your colours to the mask somewhere, mate. Yeah, no. Um, ooh, I reckon someone unpopular, it's going to be really unpopular, actually, but uh -oh. we'll sort out our left our left back issues. Somebody like an Ashley Cole. I mentioned I Ashley Cole yesterday. He too. would, you'd put him at left back. And then your troubles of left back go away. I reckon he was he was a he was a left back that bombed forward as well. So I don't think you'd have too much of an issue getting forward. He'd be defensively solid as well. And you've mentioned a lot of strikers there, so I didn't want to go down that route. I thought I'd go into a different position. Um, so yeah, I'll go with Ashley Cole. But what a question that is! It's a way. good one, isn't it? It's a good one. Um, I went I went with Van Persie in the end, but I did talk about Cole. I, I felt almost disgusting not picking Dennis Burkamp, but then just I thought about that but where in this team like where does he go he's exactly. not an out-and-out -out striker is he so where does he go in the team that was my kind of okay. thing um and I think of all the strikers that we've had down the years and we had some good ones under Arsene Wenger Robin Van Persie feels like the one that would have the most impact in this team today I agree so that's what I, I think I so with. that out-and-out -out striker bury yeah. the chances absolutely okay let's take um Let's take two or three very, very quick questions from the chat box. Um, I want to take this one from uh, Lorenzo, who says, Hi, Harry, finally caught a live show. Would you continue with Jorginho and Havertz versus, versus West Ham? Or would you bring in a Trossard or an Emil Smith-Rowe to help break down their low block? I'll throw that to you first, Connor. Would you pick the same team, essentially, um, for the trip to West Ham on Sunday? Or would you make changes? Um, I think I would make some changes. I don't think West Ham is a game for Jorginho, really. I'd like to think that we would go there on... I know we struggled against West Ham, but I'd like to think we'd go on the front foot. Um, so maybe an ESR and a Trossard would come in. I think Havertz was great against Liverpool because he just held the ball up and he threw himself around. Um, but I'd like to think we'd be going more on the front foot. So I'm not sure whether he would start up top. So to answer Lorenzo's questions... I question sorry i'd probably go for more of a trossard and an, and an esr over a kind of Jorginho and Havertz because i'd like to think we'll go on the front foot and look to kind of break them down early doors 
I would leave the team as is if Jesus is still unavailable. If Jesus is available, I'd be tempted to put him back in because I think we are going to face a low block, even though we're going away to West Ham. But then to be able to bring Havertz on at a certain point where maybe we're finding that we're only finding space in the wide areas and having to, you know, put the ball into the box, then then maybe I'd do that. But I think it would be extreme. I, I know it's a squad game and I know that rotation is part and parcel of it. I just think it would be extremely harsh to take anyone out of that team mm. that played so well. Yeah. Um, last weekend. Uh, What else have we got? I'm going to take this one from Great Conversations, who says, from this point in the season, what's a realistic and satisfactory end to the season for the team? So I guess what the question is, Connor, is what's the bare minimum that you would expect or accept, I should say, and and sort of you'll take, I guess, between now and the end of the season for you to be able to turn around and say, yeah, it was a good enough season? I I think... As long as we're in it, and as long as we're in it towards the end, I think if we finish anywhere between between the top three, I think is fair enough. I think City and Liverpool will be there, and I think as long as we're in it and the, the points gap isn't too too big, I think that's a satisfactory season for us. But I think we've got to get relatively far in the Champions League. I think Porto is a good draw for us. Of course, it's going to be tough. Every Champions League game is tough, but you'd like to think that we'll overcome Porto. When you so say like relatively far, what's what's good enough for you quarterfinals semi-finals final what would be the point where you go we've had a good Champions League campaign probably semi-final for me I I think with the teams left in it obviously there are a a couple of teams in there you'd rather not face but everybody else I look at and think you know we could we could we could beat that team we've got a night we've got a good good draw against Porto they'll be difficult but I think we should be able to overcome them over the two legs and then I think as long as we're sort of three or four points say we don't win the league for example as long as we're th- only about sort of three or four points off top I, th- I think that's a good season because I think a lot of people the difficulty is when you finish second in the Premier League obviously the only way you can improve is by winning the league but you know Manchester City are Manchester City and Liverpool have been very good up there as well however we have beaten both of those teams this season so but I'm not going to say you know we have to win the league you know, I'm not going to say that it would be a poor season if we don't win the league because I don't think that's necessarily true. But for me, I think semi-finals of the Champions League and top three, as long as we're only about four or five points off it if we don't win the league. Yeah, I think I'd look at that and say that's a that's a pretty good season as well. I think what people fail to factor in is the fact that we've had to then balance Premier League and Champions League as well. And that was always going to have an impact. Like last season, we were in the Europa we didn't go very far in the Europa, but on top of that, the Europa is a competition in which you can rotate half your team for the group stage at least, and maybe some of the knockout rounds as well, depending on the draw. You can't do that in the Champions League. We've had to no. be at our best all the time. There's been a few changes here and there, but generally it's been a, a, our strongest side. So I think that has to be factored in as well and um, and taken into consideration. I really think we can win the Champions League. I hate saying it because I feel I think like we I'm can gonna... as well. I'm going to curse the team, but I mean, I, I said to my wife, my wife said to me a little while ago, like, when is this going to stop? Like, as in, when are you going to like grow up and become an adult and stop <laughs> basing everything we do around Arsenal, like not turning up to people's weddings and stuff and like going later in the evening because Arsenal are playing and all the rest of it. And I don't think I'll ever get to that point, to be honest. But if there is a point where I could consider not, not like winding it down, but in terms of not being so upset all the time when things don't go our way, I think it's once I've seen Arsenal win the Champions League, it's the only thing missing. It's the only mm, one missing to complete the set. And if we do that, oh, different Harry, very happy Harry moving forward. Um, <laughs> and it's a great opportunity for us this season with the team, with the team that we've got, yeah. you know, the good feel around the club. You know, over two legs, and then the and then if we get to the final, that one game, you just never know. Honestly, it's a great opportunity for us, and I don't think you're cursing anything by saying we could potentially win it because I agree with you. I think we could potentially win it. Oh man, and I, and I also look at you mentioned earlier that you, you think that we haven't necessarily regressed, but that we play in a different way, and I agree with that. I think the way that we play now is even more suited to the European scene yeah. than it is the Premier League as well. That control. Um, the ability to defend really well and competently, um, even against really, really dangerous opposition. 
one final question that we'll take. I've lost it in the chat, but it was basically um, about Aaron Ramsdale, who I think, you know, it's gone a bit quiet lately, but I think probably does get sold come the summer, not because Arsenal don't want him or I don't want him, but just because I think that he won't be satisfied with the role that he plays at the football club now. What would be your approach to replacing him? Is it go and get a young goalkeeper that you think is is going to be kind of satisfied with playing that second fiddle role, but with a view to being the number one in the future? Or do you go for an experienced older head who, again, maybe is at the in the twilight of his career, more than good enough to come in for the odd game, but isn't going to have that heavy expectation or that desperation to progress? I think the latter. I, th- I think you go for that kind of that older head who's got the experience and kind of happy to fit in. I think because if you go out and you get a young goalkeeper that you know, ha- you know, wants to become number one and can push, then you just have the situation that we currently find ourselves in between Ryan Ramsdale, which becomes a bit of a side side story, really, doesn't it? And don't well, you know we got young Carl Hine as well there in in the in the squad as well. So I think yeah, I, th- I think the latter the latter for me. But it's funny how suddenly that narrative's gone away now, hasn't it? That uh, Raya Ramsdale narrative. No one ever talks about that anymore now that uh, we're starting to win games again. <laughs> yeah, it's, David it's Raya's those, playing quite well. That's it. It's one of those things that's only noisy when uh, you're not performing, isn't it? It's, that's how it goes. That's that's why I get annoyed with really reactionary stuff. Because yeah. I feel like we lost against West Ham. And OK, you know, we then put in a stinker of a performance against Fulham. I get it. People mm-hmm. were entitled to be upset about that. But it was like, you've watched this team do really well all season. You've watched them dominate a game against West Ham. They've lost it because they haven't been able to convert their chances. And all of a sudden, it's everything that we've done in the last 12 months means nothing. It all vanishes yeah. into thin air. Let's just moan. Let's just shout. Let's just argue. And it's like, come on, man. Like, mm. I was watching a stream last night. Um, yeah, I was I was watching a stream last night. Uh, a friend of mine, Dan Potts, was doing a stream and he had some contributors on there who were really, really sort of Arteta out when we lost those couple of games. And like listening to them yesterday talk about Kai Havertz and it was like, none of you can just say that he played well against Liverpool. Like, why can't you just Mm. do that? Like, you'll be taken a lot more seriously if you show that you can, you know, you can see things for what they are. If you're going to go down that route of, you know, refusing to credit people when they deserve it, you just come across as bitter and and actually... Mm as if there's not really any substance to what you're saying. But anyway, um, Connor, thank you so, so much for joining me, mate. I know we've slightly overrun, so apologies. Thank you uh, for All coming good. on. Um, remind people how they can follow you. Um, remind people how they can get hold of your TikTok. Yeah, so you can follow my TikTok, Connor Faherty, C-O-N-O-R-F-A-H-E-R-T-Y-1. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well, Connor Faherty, and on Instagram as well, uh, same one as well brilliant stuff make sure you give connor a follow make sure you leave a like on the video make sure you subscribe to the channel as well if you are brand spanking new if you're listening on audio leave us a review you know the drill by now get involved with your thoughts in the comments i know there were lots of questions coming through the chat that we didn't get through do me a favor if one of those was yours please once the stream finishes go down into the comment section below Drop the question in there and it means I can pick it up for the next show. I can't pick them up from the live chat. They disappear. So please do put them in the comments below and uh, we'll address some of those on tomorrow's episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Until the next one, take care of yourselves. All the best. Have a great day. Goodbye.